the March 10th, 2021 informal session. And I will say it's very nice to see everybody's faces here this morning. Uh, Bobby and I were by ourselves for a while and it wasn't any fun. So I'm glad to see y'all here. Um, and saying that, ready to turn it over to Mr. DeHaan. Is there anything for us? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we walked into a little bit of a different layout today, so I apologize for <laughs> some of the confusion this morning as things got turned around for the city council retreat. Um, this morning we do have, as you know, we have a very um, important item for short-term rentals coming on the agenda. We plan on doing the briefing on the short-term rental uh, regulations after we go through the rest of the agenda for the briefing uh, so that the commission can have time to speak through those items. Mr. Kemp will walk you through all those. He did hand out a sheet for that. Uh, before we get started with that, we do want to make sure um, I make a couple announcements before I hand it over to Ms. Wilson for discussion about FOIA and abstentions. Um, I do want to congratulate Wa. Wa has accepted and is now our planning evaluation coordinator. He takes over the position for Bill Landfair. So uh, we're thankful for Wa and his continued dedication for not running away from us when we were uh, in complete shambles at some point. So, um, but Wa has been a very great employee and has kept us moving. And so um, we're very thankful for him accepting the position to take over as a planning evaluation coordinator that staffs uh, your commit, your the Planning Commission. Um, uh, one more thing, I think um, before I hand it over to Ms. Wilson, um, again, we just wanna say thank you. We do wanna, well, maybe we just won't note that. Um, there is a card being passed around. I think Wa's taking care of it. The commission's aware of that. I don't wanna put people's information out there, but if you feel the need to uh, sign the card, we appreciate that for one of our staff members. Uh, Ms. Wilson, would you like to? take over for a moment to talk about um, abstentions yeah, and I don't have my own mic I don't have my own mic so <laughs> I'm gonna come here okay abstentions we have been doing them not quite right we've been doing them better than we have in the past but not quite right okay you'll have a little thing that says conflicts of interest Okay, everybody got one? Yes, okay, we got a conflicts of interest. I took these. Oh. There we go. Okay, what I would like for you to do is look through the agenda before this morning. <laughs> and <laughs> I know that's hard. And call me and tell me if you have a conflict or if you want to discuss a conflict. Because then what I can do is have ready for you a pretty letter. That will be your conflict letter and you won't have to stumble through it all. Then this goes in the minutes and then everybody in the world knows that you abstained, okay? That's what we need to do. What we're missing from most of our abstentions is an address. So if you abstain because you're of your employer, you need the address for your employer in the abstention. Don't ask me why. That's what the law says, okay? So that's what I would like. However, if you get here, and I know sometimes you get here and then you realize you need to abstain, I understand that, just read this out, okay? And then hand it to me. The next day, in 24 hours, I will get you a letter. You will sign it. You will send it back to me, and then I'll scan it out to everybody. Okay? Now, that sounds easy, right? <laughs> okay. That's where I'm going. So, if you've got to do it oral, follow the little template. If you can get to me, I'll get you a written one, and then all you have to do is read it. Okay? That would be really helpful and then we'll be good. I'm going to wipe this off because you never know. Although I have been vaccinated, so. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Mr. Redman. Um, Ms. Wilson's uh, appeal is uh, very timely and it seems like a good segue for me to bring this up. This is my letter. Mr. Weiner and I have had this discussion as have Ms. Wilson and I henceforth, I will be abstaining from any and all short-term rental 
applications as well as from consideration of the ordinance. The I and the reasons are as follows. I'm going to repeat this when we get into the formal so everybody understands. And of course, I have this letter which Ms. Wilson helpfully provided for me and which I discussed with her. And this is why I was not a participant in our last workshop. The I have a small client who is a little travel agency called Expedia Cruises. I help them find shopping center space. You know, Mr. Wall goes in, he wants to take a cruise to Cancun. He can sit down, pick out a package, and away he goes. Um, it is part of cruises, short-term rentals. Eh, you might not see the connection. It is part of a much larger company called Expedia Group, which owns a whole bunch of, of I mean, you know, uh, a whole bunch of travel assets. A couple of the assets they own are booking sites. HomeAway and VRBO are owned by the parent company. I learned this while reading the, the newspaper recently, didn't know it. So anyway, I skipped our workshop, got a hold of the city attorney, and regardless of what they have to say about it, I've decided on my own that I don't think it would be appropriate for me to participate in those discussions because I don't know who might have used either of those sites on a particular short-term rental. Um, and certainly with regard to the ordinance, I don't think that would be appropriate for me to participate. Wouldn't be fair for me to fire the client. Wouldn't be fair for my employer. Wouldn't be fair for any of us because I think the most important thing we have to do is preserve not just the substance but the appearance of our objectivity and independence of thought. Wherever that line is, as an attorney friend told me, I don't want to get anywhere near it. And so I'm going to stay as far away from it as possible. And so um, I do have a letter which now I have signed, this is my copy. Ms. Wilson prepared it for me. Very painless process. If there's anything like that that you have, I would encourage you to do it. I've always thought that anybody that came anywhere near conflicts of interest is dumber than a box of rocks, and that ain't me. So anyway, I will disappear later on when we um, get into that part of our, of, our, um, of our agenda, and that'll continue you know, as far as the eye can see, so far as I can tell. Thank you, Mr. Weiner. Thank you, Dave. Any other questions, anybody? Ms. Jacques? Ms. Wilson, I just, can you come up? I just got a question for you. My question is um, where, where I live and where I have rental properties, if it's in close proximity, what is your recommendation? I know we've talked about this, so I just want it out in the public. What it well, it really is up to you, <laughs> but what I would say is that you are, oh, you can't hear me? I was yeah. trying to avoid wiping off the thing again. Okay. And, um, um, if you are next door, I would say you probably have a, a pecuniary, a monetary interest in whether or not this goes in because of the value to you. If you're further away, you may not have a pecuniary interest. Um, we probably need to, to discuss this a little more closely. Um, where are these? Are these close enough to you to affect your home? Are you asking me now? Um, well, yeah, that's well, right. I don't, well, we've had some, and I've, I've disclosed it, but I, I don't know if I'm going to have any more. You can disclose it and be a member of a group, as long as there's three people in the group. Okay. So if you're, you know, there's more than that that would be affected by this. So if you want to say, you still have to disclose, and you have to say, you know, I believe that I am a member of a group, and so I will not have to abstain that group um, would be all those who will be affected, that kind of thing. If you want to abstain, if you don't want to abstain, I don't think there's any legal obligation for you to abstain unless you're next door. Okay, thank you. Good. Any other questions? Good, because now I'm going to wipe this again. <laughs> Just ignore me. Go ahead. Mr. Todd. Mr. Chair, I know there have been a couple instances when we've had some longer meetings where planning commissioners have had to step out from the discussion and the, and the input from the public and have chosen to abstain because they weren't there for the discussion. That is still okay, but just for the record, we want to make sure that we note in the record that I was not, a, I was not in the room for the discussion and the deliberation, so I'm abstaining because I did not have the additional information. There's nothing wrong with that, but we just want to make sure it's clear for the record. Um, more than likely you can tell that Ms. Wilson and I have been pinged on a couple of these for the last 15 years. So we're going back and looking through all of it. So um, again, nothing wrong with that type of abstention. We just do wanna make sure we note it for the record so that we can, we can have clear records. Yes, ma'am. 
if we're abstaining, do we have to step out? No, just pull your chair back. Don't talk. Okay. Informal or formal. Okay, you do not have to step out, although if I was Mr. Redmond, I would. <laughs> but, um, yeah, yeah, because it's, yeah, you're going to have a third of the meeting. <laughs> and when he does, Mr. Weiner, if you would say Mr. Redmond has left the meeting, it just yes, gets on the um, minutes and it explains why it's only eight or nine people voting. Okay. okay? Yes, ma'am. Yes, Dave. Before, thank you for that. Before we get too far, I want to compliment the staff who put who did this whole new setup. This is much brighter, um, and these screens that are placed in front of us, I think, will be very helpful in terms of going through this agenda. For so, for all you folks who, I know this doesn't take. I mean, you don't do this in 15 minutes, so I know this took some thought and some work. So, thank you guys for that. Anybody else? All right. Mr. Right. Hahn, ready to move on? Yes, sir, Mr. Weiner. Uh, we'll go ahead and move through the uh, briefings for the agenda. Um, we, like we said before, we'll skip over the short-term rental discussion to save it for the end, uh, just so that uh, Ms. Redmond has the opportunity to uh, step away also, but uh, to give you time to deliberate and discuss any of the uh, things that may come up during the hearing. So we'll go ahead and hand it over. All right. The first item is the uh, resolution for the um, 2021 Planning Commission. Excuse date. me, Wah. Can you speak up just a little bit? I know I'm hard of hearing, but just, just a little bit. Thank you. The first item today is the resolution for the upcoming uh, 2021 Planning Commission dates. And then we'll, I'll go to the... We we'll skip the second item for, and then we're gonna go to the third item. Hold on one second, real quick. Um, that that's in, that can go right on the consent agenda, correct? On the on the item one, we can just set that right on the consent agenda. No that problem. Is, that is correct. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, real quick, I'm sorry to just make sure we got this right. So we're gonna be, are we gonna be reading these agenda items into the record like we usually do? That is, that is up to you, Mr. Chair. Um, I mean, that's what we usually do. do we, is that okay? Yes, sir. Do can I can walk and you just explain item one real quick when we go through the consent agenda? Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Item number three today is um, Pressman Construction Services LLC. This is a conditional use permit for automobile service station. The applicant seeks to redevelop the site with a 4,000 square feet convenience store with, four, with eight um, fuel pumps. The 35,000 square feet vacant lot is zone B2 community business located in the short drive corridor in the Bay Side District. The proposed building features coastal architecture consists of uh, fiber cement and shake siding um, and brick veneer with a metal roof. The fuel canopy and and dump, dumpster enclosure matches the architecture material of the proposed building. The layout plan show planting along Pleasure House Row, Short Drive, and within the parking within the parking lot. The proposed development will reduce the number of entrances along Short Drive and Pleasure House Road from four to two. The existing sidewalks along Short Drive will be replaced with new sidewalks and new sidewalks will be installed along Pleasure House Road. Staff find the proposal to be consistent with the recommendation of the comprehensive plan that identify short, the Short Drive corridor is a primary residential neighborhood with commercial uses to support the residents. The plans recommend the reuse and revitalization of the existing commercial properties and preserve and protect the character of the established neighborhood. The applicant has worked with staff and the Bayfront Advisory Commission on the site layout and building elevations that are presented to you today. 
The proposal meets the requirement of the short dry corridor design guidelines that include the use of neutral colors, high quality architecture style, and building materials that are compatible with the character of the community. And based on the consideration described and further detail in the staff report, staff recommends approval of this request subject to the conditions listed in the report. Staff is not aware of any opposition to this request. Are there any questions? Dave? Um, <clears throat> well, I find it curious that 7-Eleven would approve two sites on the same side of Shore Drive within such close proximity to one another. We considered another one, what was it, a month, two months ago? But, you know, that's their decision. So the question before us, as always, is what is the appropriateness of this use to this particular parcel of real estate? I mean, is it, is, does the land use make sense? I don't find any reason why it doesn't. I mean, it seems to me a perfectly appropriate place for this kind of use. It's been a vacant parcel for my entire adult life, um, at least as far as I can remember. Uh, I'm extremely familiar with this neck of the woods, and I, I think it would be an obvious and vast improvement um, to this one parcel, so I, I think it's entirely appropriate for consent. Would you read this one? Sure. Okay, well, good. Item number four is Grace Bible Church of Virginia Beach, Inc. The applicant seeks to modify conditions of the 2017 conditional use permit to allow for changes in site design related to the parking layout, building footprint and elevations, as well as changes to the stormwater strategy. The revised layout show the parking lot as further away from um, the residences. Because the site is elevated, because the site elevation sits below the elevation of the street, approximately three to four feet of fill is proposed. Two landscape buffer will screen the rice parking lot from the adjacent residential neighborhood. The first 10 feet landscape buffer is proposed on top of a three feet berm with a six foot tall solid fence. The second landscape buffer will be a 15 feet landscape buffer along the property line with the adjacent neighborhood. The development will, will be constructed in two phases. The first phase will be approximately 17,000 square feet building with 350 seats. The second phase would add 20, approximately 28,000 square feet for a total of 45,000 square feet with um, and 800, 800 seats. The two landscape buffer between the proposed church and parking for the residents will be built during phase one. As proposed, the development exceeds the parking requirements by 207 spaces. To ensure that the development will not negatively impact the surrounding residents, staff has recommended a condition, a condition that lighting be shielded and directed onto the site and limiting the height of the outdoor light fixtures. Development, the development service sensors review the preliminary stormwater management analysis and finds that the submitted stormwater strategy has the potential to successfully comply with the stormwater regulations. And based on the consideration described and further detail in the report, staff is recommending approval subject to the conditions listed in the reports. According to the applicant, a virtual meeting with the surrounding neighborhood took place on January 28th to discuss the project. Staff is not aware of any opposition to this request at this time. Are there any questions? Mr. Worsley? Thoughts? We're talking to each other. Now, I agree that this this can be put on should be put on the consent agenda. I think this is going to fix a lot of problems in that area that uh, that have been created and that, that wasn't the church's fault anyway. So, so, I think this needs to be put on the consent agenda. Hey, Jack. Okay. Yeah, and uh, I concur. I mean, I, I feel it should go on the consent agenda, but I do have a couple things just to just to bring up. Um, just want to rehash some, not necessarily rehash, but um, discuss uh, a couple things with this application because it, it came through, but those parcels, that area adjacent to Lena Bridge Road, 
we had uh, we had quite a bit of discussion on that, and there's some pushback on on rezoning that area to to commercial, uh, which it's not. It, that area remains. What does that remain? Is it um, what is that? The parcels that are in the fronting, on a bridge road. They're they're still agricultural. So they're still agricultural, right? Um, but the church does the church own those own those parcels? No, I don't believe the church owns that prop. Those okay, so the church doesn't fronting. own that property. So someone else owns it, and with the anticipation of potentially in the future developing that. But I think that was some of the development or that was some of the pushback previously wasn't it was was that you know the line of sight you know traffic accidents um so I, i'm fine with the way it is i mean it would have been nice you know to pull it away from the neighborhood to a certain extent to provide more buffer um, but it looks like they've they've gone to a, a decent effort to to provide a buffer um screening and the, the second thing you know, I want to bring up is that you know we've had similar um, church expansions um, where we've you know, that have presented quite a problem um, to the city and to the surrounding community because of this very same issue, same thing right there, that they they brought their parking lot up two to three feet. You know the lights, the just the impacts. You know didn't preserve hardly any buffer, really any buffer, and and planted a few few trees um, and it, and you know, much heartache with the the surrounding properties so but you know I'm, I'm assuming that this has been looked at that it appears that the buffer is is greater than what uh, what it was in the case that you know I'm, I'm discussing piney grove yes yes piney grove um, Mr. Wall, so yes, the, the buffer has increased, so they pulled the parking lot away from the adjacent properties. Uh, they provided landscaping, essentially landscape buffers at both the base of the berm, essentially, where they're doing their stormwater management next to the properties, as well as up at the top to help to screen any potential impacts. So um, that was one of the key points to, to try to mitigate the issue, similar to what we had at, the, at another application location. So, um, but again, they have, Two, two buffers essentially, one up high to screen the parking lot and the parking area, as well as there's a condition to limit the lighting and the perimeter of the parking area to, to no taller than four foot, while the lights on the interior of the parking area are no, uh, no taller than 12 foot, so, or 12 or 14 foot. Ms. Oliver. So Bobby, um, yeah, this this got my attention only because of the previous expansion on the church with the parking uh, lot being raised and the the issue with the lighting uh, with the neighbors. It was um, impacted them very much. So the other thing was that the berm. I just want to make sure that it stays as it is depicted, only because we've had some problems with berms in the past that they weren't. Um, they weren't either to the height or to the description when the developer went in and did it um, on other sites. And I think we had, a, we had a problem once with a berm. I think it was um, out on Taylor Farm on that as well, that it wasn't kept up to the specifics that was intended. I probably should clarify. So when I say berm, and I apologize for the uh, misunderstanding. So the elevated portion that they have where the parking area is, is where they're, so they're elevated and their stormwater management goes underneath. Adjacent to that elevated portion, uh, Nicole, can you go to the profile? Yep, that one. Uh, adjacent to that elevated portion is the first landscape buffer, which includes a fence there, mm -hmm. okay? And so then it's not really a berm, it's actually part of that, that level ground. Then it slopes off to this other, to this increased landscape buffer area that's adjacent to the property line. So it can't reduce. If it does, it means there's something wrong with their stormwater management. It has to stay in that, that height in that location. Yeah. 
<clears throat> One thing is that on this on their uh, layout schematic, um, they've got a hatch pattern on there where that pipe shows on the perimeter that that appears to be gravel. But I guess what they're representing is the gravel underneath. That that's the berm that we're that you were just mentioning, is that it's it's where it's rising up. And then that's the correct. pipe is the perimeter piece. Because if you look at it, that hatching is a gravel. Right. Yeah. That's that's part of their stormwater management solution. That's underground, and above that is earth. And they do they have. Th that's correct, Mr. Wall. You're correct. Okay. Can I'm sorry, Nicole. Can you go back to the the profile again? That gravel hatching you see is the gravel hatching shown in this profile. Yeah. It's, it is underground. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'd like to add that uh, Wall and I actually walked the site last week. Um, this site is tremendously larger than the other site was, the Piney Grove. Also, um, this site is the closest to the neighborhood, and some the closest to the neighborhood is 170 to 160 feet from the berm, from the neighborhood line. So this is a lot farther away than than we did, than we had the other project with. So um, I feel I feel really comfortable walking the site. When I walked the site with Wall, I felt really comfortable with this one. So I'm good for the consent also. Good consent? Okay. Mr. Horsley, would you like to read that one for us? Okay, thank you, sir. All right, we're good? So Mr. Horsley's gonna read this? Yes. Okay. Right. Item five is a street closure request to close the 25 feet wide by 125 feet long and unproved portion of Holly Row adjacent to 401 49th Street. The portion of the right way has been used as a private driveway for decades, providing access to the home directly from the unimproved railway. A viewers meeting was held on December 2nd and determined that the proposed closure will, with the required easement to the city, will not result in any public inconvenience. Staff is recommending approval of the street closure request subject to condition listed in the report. Staff received one letter of concern for this request. The letter noted the need for pedestrian access between 49th and 50th Streets and request for a 10 feet access easement with the proposed closure area to be retained for pedestrian access. Questions? Yes, ma'am. It's fine. Could we please go back to the photograph and can someone show me there what part is looking to be closed, please? It will be the, the driveway to the uh, left. That is right now the portion, the half portion of the railway that is proposed to be closed. Okay, so half of the driveway? The entire the entire driveway. So the half of the portion of the railway <laughs> extend to a little bit beyond that driveway, and so it's the, it's the west half. Okay. Th uh, thank you, Mr. Tahan. Um, I received a call about this this weekend. Um, I think he's going to be here to mm -hmm. present. Um, I feel like we're going to hear this one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he told me yesterday he was going to be here yeah. to speak. Yeah. Go ahead. Juan, the, this... I wish, I would like in the future, if you all could give us a better photograph so that you can actually see where this road is in regards to the house. Because if I'm not mistaken, the house sits sideways, is that correct? Is that the house that sits sideways on that street? I mean, I know I can Google map it, but I'm not very good with that. Uh, so <laughs> the, the front door of this house actually faces that driveway. Right. Yes, so it is sideways, yes. Just curious, be, why do they want to close that when that is available parking for them? I mean, are they closing it to put a driveway in? And just trying to figure this out. So they have a driveway right there right now. They just want to close it because a portion of their porch is encroaching into it. And the, of course, they have their driveway in that railway also. Right. So they just want to close that so that they absorb that half portion of the unapproved right away. So I'm trying not to be. So is the entire road their driveway or is part of it public street? 
half of it, uh, so their driveway is entirely within the right way. The railway, it, the entire width of railway is 50 feet. They are only closing the western half of the 25 feet. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, Robin. Their driveway, this public right of way, is that a through street or does it go to a dead end? Can you go back? Right now, um, it's kind of dead end. It deads end um, with that, with where their property starts right now. Okay, so could I walk from Holly Road and go all the way down their driveway and get to the alley? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. Y y potentially, yes. Okay. There is a strip, uh, I believe a 10, 15 feet strip a um, alley on the back of their property. Okay. At first. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't connect all the way to 50th Street. Okay, thank you. Mr. Redman. I mean, my question is, who cares? <laughs> I mean, this is, if you read the staff report, this, this section of Holly Road has been plotted, platted for over 100 years and has never been improved or utilized as a public street. The western portion of this unimproved right-of-way has been used as a private driveway for decades with portions of the porch in the right-of-way for many years, providing access to the home directly from the unimproved right of way. There are paper streets all over the place that serve no purpose. They serve no purpose whatsoever. There, and there is ample precedent, I can tell you, because the better part of 20 years ago, my neighbor across the street had a private paper street, I mean, a, a public paper street that was platted decades ago, served no purpose whatsoever. He and the neighbor, he and his neighbor, came to the city, had that closed, paid them a chunk of money for the land, which has you know, not much value. This doesn't have any value, really, if you think about it. The city will get some monetary compensation because it has some nominal value, but it doesn't do anything. And so the idea that we have these paper streets that don't really do anything doesn't seem to me to make any sense. It, it just it seems to make a lot more sense that they be incorporated into these. Another 100 years, it will not change. So I think we're getting way too wrapped up about something that really doesn't amount to anything. Thank you. Mr. Carson. I actually took time to ride by and look at it the other day because of the call and uh, from my point of view, the public safety aspect, uh, because I didn't realize it was a paper street until mm -hmm. I actually rode down there and looked. Uh, the neighbors are in the right of way also. I mean, th that park, that driveway is, is part of the right of way. Um, it, it doesn't look like, I mean, it would take somebody to actually uh, redevelop all three of those lots and it would be of no benefit to them because they would lose space. So mm -hmm. it, 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 I think it's a moot point just, like he says, it's, it's never going to be used for anything. Right. Mr. Alcrez? Well, I mean, I, I agree with Mr. Redmond. I think we should close the whole street. <laughs> just, <laughs> the adjacent neighbor is probably going to want to do the same thing but just throwing that out there. Just a little um, information. There is originally, you know, there was a effort to try to get the applicant to close the entire street. The application was submitted and everything, but due to family related issues, the Eastern half of the side, they, w they had to withdraw their applications because of family related issues. Mr. Wall. Well, there's, it doesn't appear that there's any access on 50th Street. I mean, even if... There's not. There's a house there. There's a house there. There's a and house there's no behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anybody else? Well, I think we all know there's a lot of streets in the North End that are like this and uh, that are not, you can't, nothing can be used. So this is something I think this basically is just doing, clearing up some things, and I personally have no issue with it. But I think... We are going to hear this because I believe this gentleman told me he was coming in to speak. Did he sign up to speak? Well, Mr. H um, Hayes? Hey, yeah. Hey, yes. David Hayes. Or David Hayes? Yes, sir. Okay, so we're going to hear this. All right, moving on. The next items are items six and seven for Dam Next Storage LLC. The separate the subject property is known as Vector Park, was zoned from 
was rezoned from AG1 and AG2 agriculture districts to conditional I1 industrial district in 2005 for office warehouse and storage uses. The southern partial was de developed with self-storage units. The eastern half of the site is developed with office warehouse and bulk storage yard. The applicant now seeks a modification of proffers and a conditional use permit to expand the office warehouse and bulk storage yard uses onto the re remaining western half of the site. The modification of proffers requests include the amendment of proffers 1, 2, and 4 that were associated with the 2005 rezoning. Except for proffers 1, 2, and 4 that are proposed to be amended for the western portion of the site, the proffers associated with the 2005 rezoning remain in effect for the entire Vector Park development site. The proposal includes four office warehouse buildings totaling approximately 24,000 square feet and two area for bulk storage, storage yards. The storage yard areas are fenced in by an eight foot tall privacy fence, privacy and chain link fence. The majority fence is solid, except chain link fence is proposed along the eastern side of the subject site that faces the interior of the lot, not visible from the public railway. This is a deviation to the requirement of section 222 of the zoning ordinance, which require bulk storage yard area to be enclosed by a category four screening consists of a minimum six feet tall fence in category one with, within a minimum of five feet wide planting bed. Since the storage area will be screened by existing wooded area to be preserved, staff is ag agreeable to the, de to the deviation request. The proposed building materials and style are consistent with the buildings on site. Traffic engineering staff reviewed the, the request and no concerns were raised as the use for storage yard and office warehouse generate very lo low traffic volume. In addition, Development Service Center reviewed the preliminary stormwater management analysis and find that the, storm, the submitted stormwater strategy has a, the potential to successfully comply with the stormwater regulations. Based on a, this consideration and further detail in the report, staff recommends approval of this request subject to the conditions and deviation as stated in the report. Staff is not aware of any opposition to this request. Are there any questions? I have to abstain from this item, so Mr. Wall will take over. Okay. Um. Well, was there a change in the fencing type from wood to plastic? Vinyl for this? The proposal is a for a solid fence. It doesn't specify um, whether it would be um, wood or vinyl. Okay. Do you, if you have a preference, we can certainly make that a, a condition. I don't have a preference, whatever the applicant. Yeah. The um, existing uh, fence on site right now is a vinyl fence. Okay. No, I don't have a preference. Whatever suits the applicants. Yes, Bobby. Ms. Oliver, just to, to note, the, I believe the applicant's representative um, want, was requesting that the, it just be noted to be a, a solid fence and for them to choose the material uh, based on the location. So um, we don't, although the rest of the site does use a vinyl or, or a different type of maintenance-free fence, the location where this wood fence would go is adjacent to the a wooded area, essentially. Uh, and not visible from the right of way. So staff is is indifferent to what type of fence material that would go here. Thank you. It was just a question someone had and I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, just to clear that up a, a little bit. Oh, sorry. Didn't mean to get you in trouble. Jack. Yes. Um, the applicant's representative on the way in told me that they intended to put a wooden fence in there and that's for appearance sake. The vinyl that's on the other portions of the site has got some discoloration and all that. They just think it'll look a lot better if they have a wooden fence and it seems to me that's a very good reason to choose that that material over and on. So I'm, I would certainly support that. No, I, that was, I was just trying to clear, I was trying to clarify that because um, there was some confusion on that. Thanks. Is anybody else? Um, I've got a, a couple questions. Um, one is the, uh, there's the 15 foot buffer, which is, they plan to 
maintain and then replant um, 15 feet. But I'm curious, and, and city staff may not know this, but part of part of the wooded area right there is in the right of way. So 15 feet is not very wide, but I believe that um, that they can only clear up to that 15 feet is within their property line. So outside of that, they wouldn't be able to touch what's on the right of way. So even though they are preserving 15 feet, replanting 15 feet up to the back of their their buildings, um, it, the buffer may be a little bit bigger, a little bit wider than that. Would you concur? Would the staff concur on that? Or That's correct. So the applicant could only preserve the 15 feet buffer from where their property line starts, as well as replanting that 15 feet. The 15 feet replanting proposed area had to be removed in order them, for them to put up the building there. Okay. All right, and I don't think that it's, it would be visible from Drake's mile, no, just the way that it, you know, most of it is, um, I mean, it, there's already a property, um, a use between Drake's mile and, and this use. So I'm, I'm fine with consent. Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, and and to be clear, I mean, this, I mean, this whole area is is covered with this kind of product. I mean, there are warehouses and distribution facilities and all that, and we've, mm -hmm. over the years, because of its proximity to Oceana, have encouraged these kinds of uses in this part of the city. So, the use itself is entirely appropriate. Even if you can see it, you can see an awful lot of them in there. If you, um, at Taylor Farm and and, up, and all up and down a lot of these roads that are around there. So, I mean, it fits very well within the established uses in this part of the city. Thanks. Okay. Anybody else? Um, can somebody read this into the record? Any volunteers? Uh, okay. All right. Thank you, Rob. All right. Ms. Klein's going to read this into the record. Okay. Thank you. We will now move to the short-term rental part of the uh, agenda. Um, our, sta our staff, Will Millers, will present the um, item eight um, virtually. Case number eight. Staff recommends to the Planning Commission that this item be deferred for 30 days due to non-posting of the required public notification yard signs as described in Appendix A, Article 1. Section 108A of the City Zoning Ordinance. In this instance, the signs were not retrieved by the applicant's representative until March 4th, 2021. All right, case number nine. Uh, 721 13th Street, this is in the Beach District. This 5,250 square foot lot is located within the R5D residential district and contains one single family dwelling. According to city records, this home was constructed in 1984 and contains three bedrooms. The applicant purchased the home on May 29th, 2020. The property lies within the RPPP boundary where parking during the evening and overnight hours is limited. Based on this, a condition is recommended that would prohibit the occupants of the short-term rental from parking in the street during the restricted hours. No records of zoning violations relating to short-term rental use were found associated with the subject address. The applicant accepts City Council's recently imposed conditions, reducing the number of bookings in a seven-day period to one and limiting the overnight guest calculation to two per bedroom. This property is located within the Lakewood subdivision, which is a neighborhood composed of a multitude of housing types with a few scattered commercial uses. The subject property sits within a neighborhood block comprised of single family dwellings and duplex dwellings. Because the home contains three bedrooms, three off street parking spaces are required. However, the existing driveway configuration can only accommodate two spaces without impeding the, on, onto the city sidewalk or into the city sidewalk. As a result, the applicant proposes to add one additional parking space abutting the existing driveway. 
By doing so, all three off-street parking spaces would be accounted for and none would obstruct the city sidewalks. Recommended condition number three was added to address this matter. As permitted by section 24121 of the city zoning ordinance, the zoning administrator reviewed the applicant's parking configuration and deemed it acceptable. Together with the requirements of 24112 of the zoning ordinance pertaining to short-term rentals, a condition is recommended that limits the number of residential parking permit program parking passes to two and prohibits the issuance of guest and temporary passes through the program while the conditional use permit is active. Based on these considerations, staff recommends approval of this request with the conditions listed in the staff report. Staff received no letters of support and no letters of opposition relating to this request. I'll stand by for any questions you may have regarding this item. Mr. Akraz? Uh, yeah, um, excuse me. I haven't received any calls, any emails on this one. Um, I do put a lot of weight on that. So, uh, having said that, I, um, they meet all the criteria. And again, I haven't received any opposition. So, I'm going to recommend consent. Okay. Um, I have the only issue I have is the parking. Uh, the 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 uh, in the up here in the um, background summary site condition and history, uh, the zoning administrator has typically um, historically preferred to use more permeable surface material. Nevertheless, the zoning administrator approved the applicant's plan but left out the possibility of working the applicant to find some more permeable material. Well, our ordinance today is going to pretty much request that we use some type of permeable material, and I don't think we should be pouring concrete. How do y'all feel about that? Um, I, I just, I can't support this one. I, I just, I'm sorry. I don't like the addition to the driveway to make because they don't have the space. I think I have no problem with having the space. The only thing I would put into conditions is that it must be per, some type of permeable surface to put it in there because they meet everything. There's no opposition. And they, I just think we need to have some type of permeable surface. Uh, um, we're, we're trying to go this way for a reason, especially the beach area. Anybody? So you're saying we need to add that requirement? I would like to see that, but if Mrs. Oliver is not going to support it, then we're going to have to hear it anyway. Looking at the, the layout of the property and the addition, and sorry, Bobby. Looking at the property, the the addition of a driveway. It just it's a road. No pun intended. That um, I don't particularly think is the way we want to go in. I know that council in the past has eliminated a bedroom versus adding a parking pad, if I'm, correct me if I'm mistaken in that, but I, if, um, if George is fine with it and I'm with the David as far as the um, not pouring a, a parking pad of concrete then. Hey, Dave. Jack, I mean, I, I, I like D's you know, thoughts thoughts on this. Um, I think whatever we do, it, it needs to, you know, we need to be consistent in this. And that if, if we are, you know, looking at these in terms of um, you know, limiting the ability to, to do the short-term rental, then it's really a, something we'd have to carry through as a, um, consistency you know, across the board um, you know, as a precedent and uh, I think that the the permeable surface you know, may not look as good as a hardened you know, structured surface but I think that that's what um, you know, what we've discussed recently so I, I, mean, I, I don't know but whatever we do I think it it would need to propagate into the future um, if we do make a decision to and limit this based on the need to add a parking space. 
I understand the consistency, and I'm, I agree with you 100%. Um, but this is one where George hasn't George. has not George has not received any type of um, opposition or phone calls on it, and the staff has not received any opposition or phone calls on it. So I tend to support it in that aspect. But the only thing I can't support would be the would be the driveway pouring more concrete. But Mr. Ockridge, it's your area, so it's up to you make the decision. I mean, I appreciate that, but you just said consistency, and I think we need to do it overall. So are we going to do that every, on every one, not just the one in Lakewood? So that's what I want to discuss. As in adding driveway? Yes, I would think so, yes. Is, is that the consensus of the board is what I need to know? Everybody speak up. <laughs> Mr. <Who's> Wall. <laughs> Ms. Klein. Can we have the front of the house picture again, please? Thank you. So I think that this looks nice. Thinking about four or five of these houses, all with additional concrete or permeable surfaces, I think is going to look distasteful in the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. So you're saying don't allow any type of other parking? I'm just trying to clear it. Sure. So I would say that I do not support adding additional parking to the front of the house. For them to get this application, they have to have another parking space. Understood. Okay. All right. Mr. Inman. I agree with I agree with her. I'm you know, I'm not I'm not a fan of having to add, add, add concrete and, or even permeable surface. Uh, I can't really tell on this particular one where that's going to go. Is it on the right side or the left side? Go to the right. Go, you know, go to the left yep. where the bushes are. Yeah, so the bushes would have to be gone. So, so, so they're going to take out, take out the, the shrubs and put in some gravel or something, you know? Are we going to hear that? We're going to, you want to hear this one and discuss it? Dave? Yes, sir. I have a question. Did I understand what you said a while ago that council has eliminated bedrooms instead of putting. Did, did I catch that? Is that legal to do? I mean, can you, can you say, well, you can only have two bedrooms and two parking spaces? Can we do that? I'm not sure. So. Bobby? I'm unsure if council has actually approved one that has come forward with the reduction in the bedrooms. Um, that those have come up and those have been deferred and the applicant had to choose whether they wanted to try to eliminate bedrooms or not. So I don't, I don't know if any of them, I don't know if any of them have actually, although the applicant has proposed it as a solution, I'm unaware if any of them have actually been approved in that manner. So Bobby, there was the one on, it was a little cottage on 20, 20th Street, and they didn't have enough parking. They had a little bitty, but they had two bedrooms and somewhere, and, and probably that's what happened. It got to council and they just pulled it because they only wanted, it had two bedrooms and they were going to one because there was no way that they could get the car in the driveway. It's probably what my recollection is of that. Uh, and I'm sorry, Summer, Summer, as always, Summer being on top of it, she's, <laughs> she's uh, gone through it and she said that there have um, at least been one, but po potentially two that have had the bedroom reduction as as part of it. So, um, of course, I don't know how you enforce uh, that. Well, that, that that sheds a new 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 wrinkle. You know, I kind of agree with what what Mike and Robin said. You know, I I think putting in another parking mm -hmm. place out there is 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 uh, really going to ruin the character of that that whole area there. That's the word I couldn't think of. Okay. <laughs> so, so I, you know, I, I don't think I'm going to support this. George, is there any speakers on this one? There are no speakers signed up to this item. Okay. Well, I mean, we'll, I guess we'll hear it. We're going to hear it. Discuss okay. Discuss it formally. We will hear this one. Okay. Hey, right, David. One thing that's, oh, I'm sorry, Jack. One thing I have is that by right, they could, they could just put a parking space in there and then all this, they could come back. They could come back. If wouldn't that need to be permitted though? 
Is that is that the case, Mr. That's correct. They could, if they weren't asking for a short-term rental, they could still expand their driveway. Mm -hmm. But they would have to get a permit for the driveway expansion. Correct, but there's no, there's nothing. I don't have a, um, I don't have a mechanism to stop them from widening their driveway. It is permitted for them to widen the driveway on the property. I think you see it oftentimes when people, for whatever reason, kids start driving whatever they widen their driveways. Mm -hmm. they, uh, I, I'd vote for it uh, if they wanted to go permeable. If that's what we think is the consensus, uh, I'm in favor of that too. Okay. Well, we're going to hear it, so we'll discuss it. We'll have a discussion. All right, moving on to item 10. Well, you can pause for three seconds and then start your presentation. Thank you. Hey, can you, can you I apologize. Uh, 2513 Morton's Road, Bayside District. This 4,260 square foot lot is located within the R5R Shore Drive Residential District and contains one duplex style dwelling with each unit containing two bedrooms. The applicant also owns and currently resides in the abutting unit at 2515 Morton's Road, but that is not part of this application. Only 2513 is part of this application. According to city records, the duplex was constructed in 1950. However, it was mostly rebuilt in 2019 after sustaining severe fire damage. The applicant purchased the duplex building on March the 11th, 2019. On-street parking is prohibited on the west side of Morton's Road and is permitted on most of the east side of Morton's Road. Therefore, any overflow parking beyond the minimum parking spaces could occur within parts of the east side of Morton's Road. No records of zoning violations relating to the short-term rental use were found associated with the subject address. The applicant accepts City Council's recently imposed conditions reducing the number of bookings in a seven-day period to one and limiting the overnight guest calculation to two per bedroom. This R5R SD zoned lot is located within the community of Chesapeake Beach and contains one duplex style building as previously noted. Again, due to the severe fire damage, a majority of this structure was reconstructed in 2019. The applicant submitted parking plan depicts two required off street parking spaces within an existing compacted gravel driveway which was refreshed with new gravel during the reconstruction of the duplex in 2019. As a result of the original structure's construction year, which was 1950, the property does not contain a code compliant driveway entry apron. Therefore, staff recommends a condition requiring the placement of a code compliant driveway apron for the address associated with this request. As permitted by section 241.21 of the city zoning ordinance, the zoning administrator reviewed the parking plan and deemed it acceptable. Furthermore, the requirements of section 241.2 of the zoning ordinance pertaining to short-term rentals can be reasonably met by the applicant. Based on these considerations, staff recommends approval of this request with the conditions listed in the staff report. Five letters of support and zero letters of opposition were received by staff relating to this request. I'll stand by for any questions you may have relating to this item. Thank you. Any questions? And um, no, nobody signed up to speak on this one, Wall? No speakers. And this is Bayside, so we're not gonna ask Mr. Redmond what he thinks. Consent? Ms. Klein? So I'm inclined to support this. The homeowner is in the attached property, and so it's in his best interest if the renters are well behaved um, during their stay for his own benefit and the neighborhoods. So I would um, support this application. Okay. We go with consent on this one? Okay. Okay. Yeah, consent on this, okay. On number 11. All right, number 11. 
This is 947 Indian Circle. This is in the Beach District. This 3,829 square foot lot is located within the A12 Apartment District and contains one townhome situated within a row of seven. According to city records, this home was constructed in 1975 and contains three bedrooms. The applicant purchased a home on December the 7th, 2020. On-street parking is permitted 24 hours per day. Therefore, any overflow parking the beyond the minimum parking spaces required could occur within the public street. However, due to the configuration of the parking spaces associated with each townhome, the 900 block of Indian Circle has limited on-street parking availability. Most occurs at the end of the cul-de-sac. New rec uh, no records of zoning violations relating to short-term rental use were found associated with the subject address. The applicant accepts city council's recently imposed conditions, reducing the number of bookings in a seven day period to one and limiting the overnight guest calculation to two per bedroom. This property is located within the Indian Circle townhome subdivision, which was platted in 1975 and contains 28 townhomes. Because the subject address contains three bedrooms, three off street parking spaces are required. To accommodate this need, the applicant submitted a parking plan showing three designated areas within the existing driveway. The first two proposed parking areas are arranged in a typical pull-in back-out fashion and meet all dimensional requirements of the city zoning ordinance. The third parking area is positioned in a parallel manner and is located directly behind the other two spaces. However, this parking area does not meet the minimum dimensional requirements for a parallel parking space, which is 22 feet long. The applicant was made aware of this matter and attempted to reduce the bedroom count through the city assessor's office. However, this request was unsuccessful. As a result, the city's recorded bedroom count remains at three. Because of this, and since there appears to be no commercial off-site parking space opportunities within one quarter miles of the subject property. The applicant has chosen to move forward with this request as is, and will be asking the planning commission to approve the parking plan with the noted parallel space length deficiency. If the applicant's request is not granted, he stated that he would be willing to discontinue the use of one of the bedrooms and is prepared to accept any condition opposed upon the property by the planning commission if you see fit to do so. Because of the parallel sp parking space link deficiency, the zoning administrator found the proposed parking plan to be unacceptable as allowed by section 241.21 of the city zoning ordinance. Nevertheless, the remaining requirements of section 241.2 of the city zoning ordinance pertaining to short-term rentals can be reasonably met by the applicant. Based on these considerations, staff recommends denial of this request. Staff received no letters of support or opposition relating to this request. I'll stand by for any questions that you may have relating to this item. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and side with the planning department's uh, recommendation. I just does that mean I can put on consent or do we have yeah, to, we'll have to hear, hear it? Okay, we'll have to hear it. Okay, we will hear this one. Do we have com comments or we can talk about it? Okay, on the next one, twelve. Summer, you can pause for three seconds and then you start your presentation. Thank you. Good morning, planning commissioners. This item is Charles K. Bain and Kathy Bain, located at 915 Pacific Avenue, Unit A. This one bedroom condominium unit is located in the retreat by the C condominium. One parking space is required and is provided on site. All other requirements of section 241.2 of the zoning ordinance regulating short-term rentals can be reasonably met by the applicant. And the applicant is agreeable to the recent city council condition changes. I'll stand by to answer any questions. George? I don't have a problem at all with this one. It kind of fits in exactly where it should be for that kind of use. Yep, all right. We get a consent, everybody gets yes. consent on this one? All right, on consent. And on the 13. Seventeen Dagley uh -huh. Lane in the Centerville District. Let's try to start over. Summer, can you start presentation over, please? Hold for three seconds.
the last item is Jamie Diamond, located at 3817 Dash Lane in the Centerville District. This is an 11,649 square foot parcel zoned PDH1 planned unit development. This single family dwelling contains three bedrooms, thus three off street parking spaces are required. Are required. There is an existing 12 foot by 20 and a half foot driveway that is used for parking as well as a one car garage. It is the applicant's intention to use the garage to accommodate one parking space and to widen the existing driveway to accommodate the third additional parking space. The applicant has submitted an alternative parking plan that shows this proposed improvement and the use of the garage for one parking space. The zoning administrator has deemed this plan acceptable. If this request is granted, a condition is recommended that requires the placement of the driveway addition within 60 days of the city council public hearing. All other requirements of section 241.2 of the zoning ordinance regulating short term rentals can be reasonably met by the applicant. The applicant is agreeable to the recent city council condition changes. Staff has received two letters of support. I'll stand by to answer any questions you may have. Mrs. Klein. Uh, so I drove past here. Um, I am not a fan of the proposed parking plan. I actually would have preferred if they had gone the other way uh, to expand the driveway. Um, the neighborhood, I think, is fine for the short-term rental, but I'm not a fan of the parking plan as, as it exists right now. Would you like to make a condition or change something? We, you can always do that. We can change the condition to, to make it do as long as it, the zoning administrator says it's okay and there's room on the other side. Um, so much power. It's like the front yard on the other side. Though. Yeah, I know. It's front yard on both sides, really. I mean, this is no, I mean, no it's different. actually in front of the door. That's the porch on the yeah, house. Yeah, I know. It's going to change the look of the, the neighborhood, as we were talking about. But okay, they have to have that third space to get a, a initial use permit. Uh, so, Mr. Zoning Administrator, <laughs> was there a reason that they did not consider a the third the third space on the opposite side of the driveway? I believe it would just be a preference, um, not as uh, Commissioner Costin said, to not have it directly in front of their front door. Um, if you wanted to extend that question to Summer, she is the one who, um, you know, negotiated with the property owner, but that would be my, my guess. Summer, are you still there? Um, so um, the applicant had contacted a contractor to come out and um, take a look at adding a driveway addition, and that was the area that they had discussed. Um, and I, that was the result of their conversation um, that she let me know in the um, alternative parking plan she submitted. Um, so perhaps um, you could discuss this with the applicant, perhaps look at adding it on the other side instead of this side. Um, but that was the discussion she had with a contractor um, a couple weeks ago. And I'm sorry, I missed the part um, where you were talking about off street parking. Is that permitted in front of this house? Um. Yes, it is. Um, off street parking is permitted here. There is no prohibited parking in this area of the neighborhood. Um, yes. So I'd like to hear this one. Okay. All right. We can talk to the applicant. All right. We will hear this one. From 13 to be heard. All right. That takes care of all that. Dave, can I ask, can I ask Kevin a yes. question? Sure. Yes, sir. If, if uh, somebody redesigned that and put half of the space on one side of the dri existing driveway and half on the other side, is that possible? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, it becomes an issue of having the correct space. So if it were shifted, right. uh, as you described, that would be an acceptable plan. Yeah. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Make all right uh, takes care of all yes, yes are sir. you still going back to item two yes sir we'll okay. be back to item two number right now we're good for item two all right 
Good morning, Chairman and members of uh, Commission. I will briefly go over item two. My goal here is to uh, really get on the record and remind you of what was discussed. If you'll remember, you've had two virtual workshops uh, on January 28th and February 22nd. You've discussed all these items, so I'm going to remind you where those discussions, where the consensus was, uh, so as to really direct the uh, formal hearing and how we, you will move forward with a recommendation. So it is divided up uh, in the staff report. We divided it up into two A, B, C, D, E, and F, um, just to make it easier. What you're seeing here on the screen in front of you, item two, this is all of them. You know, in one, um, we broke it up for ease of, of consideration of the items. So, Cole, if you go to item A. Uh, item A is the ordinance to establish the short-term rental uh, districts, the actual overlay districts. And there are three overlay districts that were referred uh, to you by City Council, and they were the East Shore Drive, the North End, and the Oceanfront Resort District. And I'll briefly go through each one. Uh, the first is the East Shore Drive overlay. You're seeing in that picture uh, what Council referred to you. The northern boundary of the bay, uh, the eastern boundary of the park. The difference between what Council referred and what you discussed uh, deals with the southern boundary. Council referred an ordinance that went down to the Cape Henry Drive, which is the bike path. Um, what you discussed in your uh, workshops was moving that southern boundary north to Shore Drive. So the overlay would then come right down Shore Drive, go all the way over to that condominium complex you see on the west side, shoot up to the bay. And that was the only difference in the um, in the area. You also discussed allowing short-term rentals in this by conditional use permit where council referred it to you as a permitted by right. And then there was the discussion of capping density. Um, for this overlay, you discussed it as a 10% of all dwelling units, uh, maximum being a short-term rental. The next overlay is the north end overlay. Uh, this is essentially the existing north end overlay. When it gets to the southern part of it, it goes straight down Holly Road. So, you know, the southeastern or southwestern part of the existing overlay was excluded from uh, the short term rental portion. Um, that area remained the same. The biggest discussion uh, you had in your workshops was adding the Hollies, which is the area from 49th and a half street down to 45th street that kind of wedges in between the Oceanfront Resort and the North End to add that area into the overlay district. Um, you can see that on the bottom there. Uh, again, just as you did on the East Shore Drive, you talked about uh, permitting short-term rentals by a conditional use permit where the council referral was uh, to permit them by right. Again, you talked about a density cap. However, in this district, the density cap that you discussed was a 15% of all dwelling units being short-term rentals. Thanks. The last of the overlay districts is the Oceanfront Resort. The area encompassed in this overlay is the entire Oceanfront Resort overlay as it stands now and as it uh, was created. The, uh, what you discussed was adding in the resort tourism uh, zone properties into this overlay. That is what that uh, map in the middle shows. Uh, there are not too many remaining properties that are zoned RT. Most of them were changed to the OR in that mass zoning. However, uh, the few properties that do remain to add those in and have the same criteria as the Oceanfront Resort overlay, which is to allow short-term rentals by right as council uh, passed it down to you. Um, addition, additionally, you talked about the rental requirement, number of contracts in uh, permitted per week, and different than the other overlays, you thought that two rental contracts per week were uh, appropriate in this area. Chairman, did you have a question, Chairman? Okay. Um, I am wrapped up with 2A, so if you have a question, okay, I Okay, that's what I thought. So <laughs> 
for everybody here, what we're going to do is we're going to break these down to 2A, 2B, C through F and vote on those individually like that after we hear all the speakers. Um, but just, you know, what Kevin just talked about there, we've got pretty much everything written down. We'll go over so we can vote on these individually like that. Is that okay with everybody? Okay. okay. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Klein. Um, so I applaud that idea. Um, for item 2A, does, is it all or nothing for the overlay districts? No. We, that's where we're going to come in and we're going to break it down, but we're going to have to discuss how we want to break it down and how we want to vote on it. Okay. Well, not how we vote on it. It's how you vote on it. It's how you vote on it, but we need to discuss how we want to break it down okay. to vote on it. Okay. And that is correct, right? Yes. Correct. Okay. All right. So we're doing 2A. Okay. On to 2B. Um, 2B coincides with 2A, and that is just uh, the ordinance that establishes these overlays onto the official zoning map once they're adopted. Um, so there's really, you know, the action on 2B relates directly to, to, 2B, to yeah. 2A. Um, on to 2C, and this is uh, really the guts of, of the proposal, and this deals with uh, establishing regulations and rules for short-term rentals in these overlay districts. Um, again, I'll remind you that when council passed, referred these ordinances to you, they referred the short-term rental uh, use as permitted by right. You have discussed that it would be permitted by a conditional use permit, but uh, when I go through these, keep in mind that council was saying it's permitted by right if they meet these conditions. So what I will do, um, and I passed out a sheet, you know, uh, similar to what you saw at your workshop where you can take notes and it shows what the council referred, what you discussed in your workshop, and then, uh, you know, an area for you to take notes today. But I'll briefly, you know, go through these. If nothing's changed, um, you know, it'll be pretty evident. But, Cole? Hey, hey, can I say something real quick, Kevin? Yes, sir. So on the, on the, um, on the staff reports um, under 2C, it's really – spelled out pretty good too because the summary referred to the ordinance is, is there and then the recommendation is what we came up with on our workshop which is spelled out pretty nicely except for the add in the cup five-year outside overlay areas we need to add that in there but uh, anyway just go ahead i just wanted to make that point for everybody to follow all right thank you chairman um okay i'll just go through these definition of home sharing um we all know that nothing has changed with the uh, city referral or what you've discussed. The sign posted on the, the home, city council did not refer any change to this. What you have discussed is requiring a posting on the outside of the home of a contact phone number of the operator or representative of the short-term rental, and that posting must be visible from the public right-of-way. Registration and taxes, the referral ordinance had no changes. Um, however, it is noted there that per city council dis, uh, dis direction, um, we are moving forward with creating a zoning permit, which is an annual license that will be uh, submitted to the zoning office with a fee uh, attached. Bobby, correct me if I'm wrong, you will see this in April. That, that is correct. It's part of the preparation for the budget. So you'll see that fee in, in April. So, um, oh. okay, uh, this is a rather easy slide. Trash, insurance, noise, criteria of grandfathering and use of accessory structures. Um, there was no change recommended by council and you agree with council's uh, referred ordinance on that. <laughs> I did note on the grandfathered section that staff uh, proposed to be able to administrative re administratively remove the grandfather status if the SDR was vacant for two years. However, this was not included uh, in the referred ordinance by, by council. Cool. Violations. Um, nothing has changed uh, with the city council referral and you uh, agreed with the Referral, uh, establishing overlay districts. I went over this when we discussed 2A um, about the OR and RT zoning districts allowing short-term rentals by right and the East Shore Drive and North End uh, by conditional use. That is different than the council referral. Um, 
in, in both new short-term rentals would be prohibited outside of these overlay districts. Um, we discussed the boundary changes to the East Shore Drive, the inclusion of the Hollies and the RT properties and the density caps. Um, that was all included in the discussion for 2A. Requirement for a conditional use permit in the council referral, uh, it would do away with conditional use permits. If the short-term rental were in an overlay district, it would be permitted by right if it meets the conditions. If it was located outside of the overlay district, it was prohibited. Um, what you have discussed in your workshops is keeping conditional use permits for short-term rentals in two of the three proposed overlay districts. Um, another discussion, uh, allow administrator approval and review for CUPs every five years. Uh, the way it stands, if there is a CUP, and per our ordinance, it has a five-year life uh, span to it, when that CUP comes up again, that person could not reapply for a CUP because due to the council referral, it wouldn't be a permitted use. So that CUP would go away. What you have discussed is allowing an administrative approval for existing CUPs so that if they haven't exhibited violations, have had good behavior, that they could continue and if violations are found, it would be at the onus of the planning director, planning department to move forward uh, with city count to city council for revocation of the use permit. Yes. Sure. That, um, and I discussed this with Mr. DeHaan, that was not in, located into some part, and that's where it should be in 2C, correct? And that, that so we need to add that somewhere in, the, in 2C. Please. Okay. If, if, we, if everybody's on board with that. Yeah, we need to add that on board that. so after a five-year conditional use permit, they would be administratively reviewed. Yep, and um, we will, in the time between the informal okay. and the formal, we'll figure out exactly what that language would be and where, Perfect. It, would, Perfect. where it would be. Kevin, is that with? Yes, Commissioner. Is that, is, that, is that with or without the overlay? Without the overlay, I just want to make sure. Well, there has been that discussion well, that would be up to, I think the discussion, the way I was hearing it with the workshops was all existing CUPs. That would, if we, if the overlay was removed, I just want to clarify just to make sure, y'all, if the overlay was removed and there would be no more additional short-term rentals, everything that was registered now would be able to continue the use for five years and then have an administrative review. That's what the discussion centered that they around. Would, they would be able to continue. We wouldn't take that away or remove them. Correct, and that's what it, you know, you could take that direction any way you wanted if you only wanted to uh, do that in the overlays or outside, you know, but the discussion centered around, you know, that property right of that owner you know, that had the use permit if they are not exhibiting detrimental behavior to the neighborhood, being able to extend that use. Okay. But also, D, that is even if the overlay is still kept. So basically, if the north end overlay is still there, or well, the overlay is going to stay there if we don't add to the overlay, and the north end, this will still go forward as a conditional use permit in the whole city to be administratively reviewed. Okay. Correct? Am I good with that? Okay. All right. Thank you for the clarification. <laughs> um, Nicole, could you go back one? Parking, uh, this, the one off street space per bedroom remain the same. Uh, the changes that you discussed from the council referral, council said that one space within a garage area uh, may be counted if it met the dimensional requirements. Your discussion said, well, if you have larger garages, why wouldn't you be able to count all the spaces in that garage? So you change that word one to all. Um, the other uh, change was uh, just really wording. Council referred as any spaces added on site shall be a pervious material. What you discussed is uh, making this uh, consistent with our Chesapeake Bay ordinance, which is really in our world, it's the only definition we have for impervious material. Uh, so any spaces added on site shall be 
not be impervious, and that's just a consistency thing. Uh, the residential parking permit, uh, you're very familiar with this condition as it's been added on every property that's come, come before you in the RPP area where guest, uh, temp temporary and guest passes cannot be used to cover short-term parking when it's in use. Uh, council referred it. You have no change from council. Special events, uh, council referrals. Right. Said, yes, I'm sir. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, 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 you said something that caught me off guard there for a minute. So we agree that parking, added parking spaces shall not be impervious. Okay, no, we're good. We're good. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. We're good. Keep going. All right. Catching me off guard. Um, special events. No events associated with short-term rental will have more persons uh, than the maximum occupancy of the property. And a short-term rental may not request a special event permit. Now, we've had this discussion before, special event permits. You know, it's a high level of people. 150 people is what triggers that. Um, these large events, uh, you know, are really uh, the root of, of several problems associated with short-term rentals. So to get that out, you know, any, any consideration of that out of the ordinance, you agreed with council's referral on that. Identification of a responsible party. Uh, the big change here is they still have to provide a responsible party with a address and contact information. The big difference is that council then added the requirement that they must be able to physically respond to the site within 30 minutes. Um, you agreed with a large portion of that. However, you discussed the response time and um, talked about changing that to one hour rather than 30 minutes. So that, you know, the responsible party, they get a call that there's a problem, they have to be able to address it within 30 minutes, but they have an hour to physically respond to the site if that is necessary. A number of rental contracts, the council referral has uh, awarded not more than 52 rental contracts during a calendar year. Um, you discussed during your workshops uh, the, you know, the possibility that these rental contracts, how many could be in a week that you could load them in the summer and, you know, that sort of uh, scenario. And you decided to take it in a different direction and discussed, um, you know, depending on what overlay, how many contracts per week in the North End and East Shore Drive, one contract per week and in the OR and RT uh, zoning districts to have two contracts per week. Oh. Maximum occupancy. Um, again, this is a condition. Oh, one, yes, real sir. quick, is everybody good with that? And how we how we worded that? There is that okay if I, we talk about this right now. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, is everybody good with that? With inside the um, RT and OR districts that we talked about at our workshop, Jack. So this is. This is 241.2, section 241, and 241.2, does this apply to, this applies citywide? So, Mr. Wall, the, the way that this was to be written, um, again, because of, because of the change, and we haven't written the language based on your proposal yet, but as it was referred by city council, there's a separate section created for those that are in the overlays, and it says which ones they have to follow. So the referral ordinance has a new section. I forget what, what section it was. Section 2203. 2203. And it says they will need to meet all these criteria and they can only rent so many days per week. And mm -hmm. okay. And uh, uh, another factor in uh, orchestrating it that way is with Sandbridge and what impacts Sandbridge. Uh, so you're saying it? These new regulations for the overlay do not impact okay. Sandbridge for the most part. And if they do uh, pertain to Sam Bridge, we specifically call it out. Okay, thanks. Um, maximum occupancy, uh, you've had this condition on most every application that's come through for months well, now. We, we, the original ordinance said three per bedroom. Um, it's been two per bedroom. Uh, you've been putting this condition on. Uh, so that is what was referred. It did go into a little more detail that persons under the age of 16 shall not be counted, but in no case shall the total number of people, including 
under 16 exceed three per bedroom. Um, Excuse me, I, I want to back up for a minute yes, sir. there. Yes, I sir. thought you were going to discuss something a little bit longer. Uh, the two rentals per week, uh, we're just doing that just in the beach and the... The resort, the RT, and the OR districts. Okay. And then the rest of the city, the rest of the city be one per seven days. I, I, still, I still like two per seven days. Okay. We can does discuss anybody, that. Does anybody, how does everybody feel about that? I, I missed that. Can you say it again? Sorry. Mr. Carlson, can I? I'm, I'm, I'm proposing that we just have two rentals per week for all short-term rentals as opposed to only at the oceanfront. Anybody? Don't hold back. I'm, I'm Dream of yeah, I can't do that. Yeah, I can't, I can't. And I'm going to tell you the reason why I can't do that, because there's a lot of short-term rentals that are in neighborhoods. Okay. Not just at the beach. If we could, I don't think legally we could call them out because we can't make them a an overlay area like there is already at the beach. Am I, if I'm not mistaken, that, isn't that correct? So we can't say everything west of... Um, um, whatever, um, Laskin Road or, or whatever, not Laskin Road, but First Colonial Road, everything west of First Colonial, only one per seven days. We can't do that. They have to have a, an overlay area. Isn't that correct? Am I correct on saying that, Mr. Tan? I'm just saying be consistent. Well, being, well, the OR and RT district is, is, is the resort area. Uh -huh. And that's why we're keeping it down there. Yeah, Mr. Costin, between the two zoning categories or three zoning categories, you got three different, three different animals there. Just different situations. That's why the OR and the RT was called out, and west of uh, or east of Baltic. Okay. We can discuss. I'm sorry. The, in, John, in the past, and and. Um, in the north end area, the density is so high in those lots, they're only 50 feet, and some of them have more than one, as you know, you're well aware of, they have more than one um, dwelling unit on a piece of property. And so when you add an extra rental per week, it makes it very, um, not very harmonious with, the, the residents of the streets. It's very disruptive, disruptive and it's the residents are speaking really loudly about that. So we're doing one in the OR and the? No, 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 okay. no. Two in the OR and two in the RT, but all other residential zoning is one per week. So the north end will be one per one week? One per week, yes, sir. And Shore Drive. And Shore Drive. Right. right. Okay. Basically the whole city. But yeah. the, one thing is that the correspondence you know, received from the latest supplemental uh, package had quite a, quite a few comments on that from the North End being you know, the request to do one, one per week. So it would, I mean, that weighed, right. certainly weighed on me. And I'm, you know, when we hear it, we'll hear you know, input, but um, that, that certainly was right. I, I, I'd just I like, like to confirm that everybody <clears throat> saw the supplemental that was sent out uh, yesterday afternoon, 625 pages worth. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. A lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of negative comments, mm -hmm. obviously. Okay. Well, I mean, we're gonna we're gonna talk about it when we start getting into that. That number two is number two C is actually actually the meat and potatoes of the whole ordinance. So we'll be talking about that one as we get into that. Okay, Kevin. All right, I'll wrap up to see uh, time limitations we've already discussed, um, you know, about allowing that uh, administrative approval after five years and with bad behavior bringing it back to council for uh, revocation. Maximum density, uh, we've also uh, talked about with the 10% in the shore drive overlay and a 15% cap in the north end overlay. Cool. Uh, item 2D is... Yes. Yeah. So we, we 
Well, we're, we're going to discuss all that when we get there. So keep on going, Kevin. All right. Uh, item 2D is um, just amending the use tables in each section where short-term rentals are listed as uses, uh, depending on what the ordinance, what passes, what's a conditional use, what's permitted. The use tables in the zoning ordinance would be amended to reflect what you, you know, what is approved. Uh, 2E is establishing transition rules. This is actually something we've been doing uh, as City Council referred this to you on October 20th. So any application for a conditional use permit received after that date, when it goes to Council, is subject to the rules that are in place at the time it is at Council. Um, we've been following these, and this is just a, um, a standard uh, ordinance when we're considering a change such as this. Okay. Um, lastly, 2F is the additional safety requirements. Um, I can go one more, Nicole. If you'll remember, um, Councilwoman Henley uh, spearheaded this effort uh, due to a few decks that collapsed this past season down in the Sandbridge area. Um, so she asked us to look at additional safety requirements. Yes, Chairman. I have a question. That's actually in 2C. Um, or did we move that? It was. I broke it out into 2F to make it easier uh, as it was pulled. Okay, that's fine. I, just, I'm just, um, I was getting ready to ask a question because I'm looking at it in 2C. We, it was. Okay. I did that after it went to printing. No problem. Um, okay. No problem. So the, thank you for uh, clarifying that. Okay. Um, it would be easier to pull this out to a separate as sure. it is a separate ordinance as... Okay. Um, written, no so. Um, life safety requirements, uh, as council referred it, a owner representative would have to provide the zoning ordinance with a signed affidavit annually stating that fire extinguishers are installed, where they're installed, smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors are in compliance with the building code, and that they have been inspected annually. Um, you did not discuss any changes from this requirement from the council referral. The deck safety, uh, council referred that a structural report must be submitted to the zoning office, must indicate that all exterior stairs, decks, porches, and balconies are safe. The inspection must be done by a licensed engineer or construction prof professional, and that the occupant load must be noted and put on a placard displayed at the property. This is where you had a uh, pretty in-depth discussion. Uh, one change you made was that rather than this report being submitted annually, you talked about putting a uh, every five years for the report being submitted. Um, then you went on and discussed who would be the appropriate uh, persons and professionals to perform these inspections. And the wording you suggested for that was the inspections must be done by a licensed design professional or licensed constructional, uh, construction professional. And then you discuss class A, class B um, as a qualified uh, construction professional. Can I, can I talk about that, please? Sure. Yes, sir. So um, I, I really don't agree with class A, class B. I mean, uh, to, get, to get a class A, class B, you've got to have certain... Um, level of, uh, I guess, uh, that you can withstand economically in the industry. But y you take a course and you get your class A. Definitely class B, it should not be on here. They're just a tradesman that might do the trim or install the deck. But someone that's going to be responsible enough to uh, for a five-year report, I, I, I really, I'm really strongly suggesting that you do a, either a structural engineer or an architect on that because... Um, I was a class A too. I'm just saying, I know what it takes to get a class A and they're not, you don't have to be, I don't see the liability going back to the class A if something wants to happen. I really strongly suggest that it, when you say professional, uh, that it go to a architect or a structural engineer. And definitely, please, not a class B. You just go get a license for that. I don't, I don't remember class B being on our discussion. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it was. I don't, I don't remember that. Um, so what you're saying is actually, cause since, it's, since we're looking at five years to actually have a structural engineer or an architect um, actually look and put a stamp on this, 
they know. Yeah, they're the only ones that can stamp something. Right, sure. It's, it's their yep. license. Yep. It's their certification. Okay. Uh, a class A or a B doesn't have certification. Right. Um, they can write a letter and say it looks okay, but okay. where does the liability fall is what I'm concerned about. We can change that when we go to vote on it, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, are you going to be available? So when we go through all this, when we go to vote on these things, you can stand there and direct us through all this? Yes, absolutely. Perfect. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chair, just yes. A, yes, sir. I'm, I'm sorry. Just a, just a generalize it just a smidge for Mr. Alcarez, just so that we don't run awry with anything with DPOR. We do say register, we can say registered design professional that has the necessary qualifications to do that type of work. So, Criteria, yeah. Yeah, it's... I, if we hone in on one specific one, deep war doesn't like that, so we kind of need to step back and say if they're qualified and, and, they, and they can do the seal. I know it's splitting hairs, but I just want to make sure we don't just say architect or structural engineer because there are some that branch outside of some of their uh, right. certifications, but their main certification might be, I don't know, a, a civil engineer, but they might do structural engineering as well. So again, uh, just sure. as a heads up. I, I, to so. I totally agree with that. I yeah. just know that what your department, your the permits director would like to see uh, to take that liability off the city, right, and uh, off of us too. Thanks, okay. Mr. Wall. Um, does everybody know? Would they know what deck deck means by defining you know, just by the the way that it's it's stated? I mean, what's the? Um, I mean, I would say I, I I could say well this is deck, and somebody would say well you're six foot six inch you know thing off the ground is a deck um, right and i don't know off the top of my head to be honest we usually in situations like this in the zoning world we like to uh defer back to definitions in the building code if we can mm -hmm. uh, we like to have consistency there i am not entirely sure how the building code defines deck um which is an interesting question, and I do remember uh, you jogged my memory on that discussion as to, well, would we require this with a ground level deck that's only six inches off the ground? What you know, safety hazard is that really presenting versus a second story deck? Um, or does a screen porch uh, require this uh, certification? So uh, I think we could probably do some uh, research in the interim, and I think that might be a good conversation to have. I think doesn't, it should, doesn't a uh, ground level deck or like six inches off the ground it doesn't require a building permit? Is that correct? Eight. Uh, a ground level deck typically does not require a building permit. That's correct. So would we want to define it as a deck that requires a building permit? And I think that's going to be defined in the building code also. Yeah. So I think this should be follow the building code. This particular one should be. <clears throat> Uh, There's um, a Virginia 2012 Virginia Residential Code typical deck details <laughs> put out by the city that has all of the notes on what is considered a deck under Virginia law. Um, <laughs> that I'm not going to interpret for you because that was the <laughs> mess. Uh, uh, but that's available for us to reference. Mr. Weiner. Um, yes. So any deck when you build it, it's structural. I know you guys have built decks, so I, I say overall decks, because when you build a deck, it's still holding up above the ground. Mm. It's still got members above the ground. It's gotta be supported properly. Um, if it's not supported and connected right, it could still cave in at six inches, five feet, whatever. I, I think it's still the same. I think a deck's a deck. Concrete and wood? I don't think Concrete's considered a deck, is it? That's considered, that's considered like a patio. Well, then we, but we do have, it actually calls out for um, most included exterior decks, porches, and balconies. You, you could have, um, you know, it's, it's, think about hotels and apartment buildings. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they have balconies that are concrete. Um, so as it is written, uh, it's not material specific. So, yes, the concrete would be included as okay. material. Okay. Yeah. Mike, did you want to add something? No, okay. All right. I'm sure we can, we're can. we going to dig into this one, too, so we can define it right, how we want to get put, how we want to do it. 
And that is what I've got for you uh, for this informal presentation. So okay. uh, if there are no more questions, I look forward to standing in front of you at the formal. We're, we're going to hear this one. Uh, I think we're going to hear this one. I was, I was hoping for consent, but <laughs> I was overly optimistic. We were too. <laughs> so I have one question. It's yes, sir. Just direct. So I'm, I'm being asked, I'm getting calls and uh, asked, A-S-K. <laughs> Um, the enforcement of this? Are, are, is the city hiring more staff, Mr. Tahan or Kevin? I'll, I'll take you, Kevin. <laughs> yes, we are hiring additional enforcement staff to, to do this. We, we, we understand that as part of this, is it's bookended, right? So we're, we're going to push these regulations. We need to do proactive enforcement uh, where we're actually going out and inspecting these on a, on a random rotating basis throughout the year. And so that is, that is part of the program as we move forward. So Kevin, as he's been working on this, has also been working on putting together the program for enforcement as well. So, so when there is a violation, is, is part of the program going to go out to that residence and talk to them, or do you just take a report? Yeah, what is, what's going on? Yes, um, the plan would be to have boots on the ground type okay. uh, of staff. Um, you know, I'll be very, very frank that filling these positions is proving to be challenging. Um, so, but yes, eventually we would like to have those, you know, we have the two components of enforcement. We have the office component, which is the tracking, which is the ensuring they're registered, uh, collecting any applicable fees, uh, you know, I have that end. And then you have the field, which is out there you know, meeting with the neighbors, uh, investigating, okay. um, dealing with, you know, working hand in hand with the police, with 311, um, to put together those pieces to then be able to track. Perfect. And then, you know, worked within that is the third party contract we have with host compliance, um, which monitors activity and identifies short term rentals. So that's kind of how the enforcement, the you know, 60,000 foot view of enforcement. Now, you know, my challenge is to dig in and really try to get those pieces working to, to make that happen. Sounds good. Any other questions? Yeah, I got a question. Okay, Mr. Torsen. Back on this decks, <laughs> is what structures do, do decks, these restrictions apply to? Is this applied to every deck in the city? Every uh, home in the city that has a deck? Every home that is being used as a short-term rental it, that has it. It has to be used as a, a rental. Correct, okay. yes. This does not span across every home in the city, only if it is a short-term rental use. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, so we're good to go. We'll on this and we'll, um, we'll, we'll enjoy having you up here with us. All right, thank you, Chairman. Thank you. All right, so before we go any farther, let's make sure we have everything, what we're doing here. Um, you wanna go through it, let me go through this real quick. You wanna go through it? Yeah, I'll go through it. Um, for um, agenda item number one, we have consent and the city's gonna read that one. Mm -hmm. uh, agenda item number two, we're gonna hear. Agenda item number three is consent, and uh, Mr. Redmond's going to read that one. Uh, agenda item number four is consent. Mr. Horsley's going to read that one. Agenda item number five we're going to hear. Number six and seven uh, is consent, and uh, Ms. Klein is going to read that one. Uh, agenda item number eight is deferred, or has requested deferral, and I'm not sure what the 30 days, okay. Uh, agenda item number nine, we're going to hear. Agenda item number 10 is consent. Um, this is the short term rental. Number 10? The Morton's Road. That one is. Um, oh, consent. I'm sorry. You're right. Yep, consent. consent. Yeah, that's, that's up in Chicks Beach. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, agenda item number 11, we're going to hear. Uh, 12 is consent. And agenda item number 13, we're going to hear. Okay. Mr. Wall, may I 
as part of the consent agenda, I'm sorry, the uh, items number six and I guess item number six, the conditional use permit for the bulk storage for the dam next storage one. There was discussion about the fence material. We do need to amend condition number two to note that uh, okay. the fence material right. will just be six foot tall. With, with amended condition number two for yes, the fence material. that's correct. Okay. All right, we're good there. Everybody on the same page? All right, who, anybody want to volunteer to do the uh, prayer? Oh, where is it? You had it last. Do I have it? I didn't, I didn't see it. No, I never got it. We got to wing it. Will. Anybody like to do the prayer? I will if you need me. I'm Mr. Cosson, thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Anybody want to do the pledge? Are we going to say just keep standing for the pledge? I'll do it. Okay, Mr. Horsley, thank you. All right, that's it. We are good. Any more discussions? Anything at all? Anybody have any questions? Nope. We are adjourned and we'll be back at 12.